from your personal perspective, just in your own experience, you know, what do you find so uniquely interesting and attractive about French philosophy in particular? You know, I first really fell into reading philosophy voraciously uh, as a teenager. I, well, I would say as a, as a kid, unsuccessfully, I tried to read thinkers like um, Plato and Kant. I mean, I was like eight trying to read The Critique of Pure Reason. And after, you know, getting through two pages, I was just like, well, I'm not ready for this. And uh, <laughs> which rightly so. But coming back to it, uh, you know, um, and around the age of 16 or 17 was the next time I really tried to delve back into philosophy because I had always known that, you know, the general definition of philosophy was a kind of undertaking of these big questions that um, since we've had, since uh, humans have had language, we've, they've kind of, well, they've also before language, but they've posed these questions of, you know, uh, what does it mean to be? What does it mean to know? Uh, you know, for what can we hope? I'm, you know, going through Kant's three questions. In any case, I uh, really philosophy finally spoke to me through uh, the works of uh, of Nietzsche. Um, specifically, the first book I read, really cover to cover of philosophy, was uh, Beyond Good and Evil, and it, it's it spoke to me. Uh, I, I won't say that I understood everything at the time. But there was something uh, even beyond grasping all of the ideas. There was something that unlocked uh, a new or a renewed thirst for striving to understand, striving to, to pose questions. Really, really was the first time I think that I um, was actively thinking critically. Uh, as you know, Heidegger asked this, this question, are we thinking, you know, what is thinking? And... Uh, even then, maybe I wasn't, but I, I was starting to. I was on the verge of it. I was, I was yearning for enlightenment for the first time uh, beyond a simple grasping of it. And that kind of led me to engage with the history of philosophy in various different ways and all kinds of different manners. And um, through my own discipline, uh, I was kind of forced into uh, two avenues that got me into French thought. Um, in the modern sense, um, which was uh, two of the thinkers I mentioned earlier, Derrida and Deleuze, or not, not Deleuze, that was later, but Derrida and Lacan. I, I needed to understand deconstruction as, as you know, grasping at straws at the time and needed to understand the, the contemporary psychoanalytic approaches to literature. You know, um, uh, one of the texts in the Norton anthology of theory and criticism is uh, a very, very short text, but one for which maybe Lacan is most famous for besides his uh, seminar on the Perloin letter, which is the, um, the entry of the eye into the symbolic field, something like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And um, it's the mirror stage, right? This is a very famous little text. And um, uh, the example was uh, studying... Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which basically is open to virtually every different lens you could bring to it, um, but one of which is uh, the Lacanian mirror stage. And, um, and that, that sort of opened the door for, okay, this, there's something exciting going on here. And, and then, and then uh, discovering Derrida, discovering Lacan quickly uh, was made me forced into discovering uh, Foucault and Foucault's oeuvre is, is all over, you know, uh, English departments. And that led me to people like Deleuze and Guattari, uh, Kristeva, uh, Erigerai, um, Baudrillard and his famous text on uh, simulacra and simulation. All of these thinkers that, uh, as, as I said earlier, get lampooned and criticized deeply by uh, Sokal and, and Brinkmont in their, uh, their scathing little review of the humanities. Because this is the question we are talking about. So it, it, it really seemed that the contemporary, yeah, is the humanities and the French uh, uh, philosophers, that they, they seem intertwined in a way that no other overlap seemed relevant for me. Maybe for listeners, I could do a really quick uh, and dirty kind of recap on the, on the, on the, on the lineage here. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, or if you know anything better than I do, but basically what people might not quite grok in, about the history of ideas is that 
the, one of the reasons why you might have started with Nietzsche in explaining your interest in French philosophy is that basically the, the lineage kind of goes, well, Nietzsche is well known as being a precursor to Freud. Uh, a lot of people basically read Nietzsche as a kind of radical psychologist. And, and, and I think it's pretty clear and I think it's pretty undisputed that Freud uh, pretty much kind of steals or lifts a lot of ideas from Nietzsche. And he says it. He says it himself that he tried not to read Nietzsche in order not to taint himself. But go on. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I think that that's uh, more an indication of the influence than an absence of the influence, right? Um, yeah. So through through Freud and the psychoanalytic project, then you get up to people like Lacan. Uh, of course, it, Lacan is the the famous uh, and, and actually quite notorious uh, French kind of spin on uh, psychoanalysis, but also as you kind of alluded to. People like Derrida, who also is one of the more notorious of the, uh, you know, rhetorically excessive uh, French theorists, are really, really kind of swimming in the culture of psychoanalysis, which people today, especially in the West, kind of forget that in the middle of the 20th century, psychoanalysis was was really all the rage. It was like it's kind of almost hard. It's hard to describe for people today how kind of culturally prominent and influential uh, and kind of respected psychoanalysis was as as a kind of science of of or or at least a kind of pop science of uh how humans behave and and you know how they can uh therapeutically heal themselves so lacan derrida are kind of swimming in this current uh of of freudian psychoanalysis uh and so that's one lineage where nietzsche, you kind of go from nietzsche to kind of the more radical excesses of of french philosophy in the middle to late 20th century but another uh kind of parallel lineage that a lot of people don't really know is that well, a lot of people know that Foucault was obviously influenced by Nietzsche, and there are a lot of you know pretty explicit references, and and that's quite well documented and well known that in a lot of ways uh, Foucault is following the the genealogical methods uh, of, of of Nietzsche. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know quite as well is that Deleuze w- was uh, was arguably just as essential as Foucault in the introduction of Nietzsche to to radical French thought, because actually, although you get Nietzsche running up into uh, mid 20th century radical French theory through the psychoanalytic route that I just kind of elucidated, um, there actually wasn't full French translations of most of Nietzsche's works until I believe uh, Foucault and Deleuze together co-edited the uh, the major French tr- translations of Nietzsche's work. So it's only really with Foucault it's only really with Foucault and Deleuze that Nietzsche enters the French language uh, at a relatively late stage. Um, so, okay, so that's all. That's a kind of quick and dirty kind of uh, summary of, of the intellectual history, at least as far as I know. And I'm sure I'm leaving a lot out, but that might help people kind of parse what you just said about how you kind of got interested in these ideas. Um, so, my follow up question to to your first set of comments was, um, oh shoot, I'm. Totally. I totally forgot it after giving that a <laughs> nice little spiel. Well, it was something it was going to be something to the effect of um, what do you make? Uh, like, so I'm very sympathetic to French theory. I think it's really cool and very fascinating. And I think I think, you know, the the some of the rhetorical excesses that French philosophy is notorious for. I I'm I'm I'm, I'm inclined to see it quite sympathetically in the sense that I see the rhetorical excesses. Uh, and if it's not obvious for our listeners what I'm talking about, you know, I'm, what I'm basically referring to is one of the reasons that French philosophy gets a really bad rap is because the writing is extremely flowery. It's very provocative, uh, you know, especially people like Derrida and Lacan. They were, you know, really addicted to uh, really extreme overstatements is one way to put it, or at least how they come through in the in the popular English translations. It sounds like, you know, they said they do kind of sound like charlatans uh, in certain... So I'm actually, although I'm sympathetic to them, I'm also sympathetic to the kind of more hard-nosed Anglo critique of radical French theory as being pro- prone to all kinds of rhetorical uh, exaggerations and inflations and ridiculousness. So I'm just curious, you know, uh, especially, you know, since you're a translator and you're you're so familiar with these texts, I just wonder, what do you... What do you like? How do you read the 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 rhetorical excessiveness of of French theory? Like, uh, presumably, you're more sympathetic to it than you know maybe some of the critics are. But is there you know just what are any of your reflections on that? Yeah, I mean, you could say I'm 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 perhaps biased, but um, I do think that for some of these thinkers like 
uh, like Derrida and Deleuze and Foucault and, uh, you know, part of what is, um, part of what dominates early 20th century French philosophy is this um, upsurge in an interest in Hegel. Um, and Lacan was uh, attending these lectures in the 20s and 30s with someone um, like Kojev who brings in, uh, or, you know, they might have pronounced it Kohevi. I, I have to look at his uh, lineage. I have to look at his lineage to see how he would pronounce it himself. But he, he's, he's famous for giving these lectures on Hegel and really giving, giving this. He, he, that, so Hegel dominates the early 20th uh, century. And then someone like Heidegger through being in time and, uh, and Husserl, they, so Husserl, Hegel and Heidegger, these are these three, the three H's, the three German thinkers that dominate the pre World War II French era. And so someone like, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, is the, you know, and, um, um, I'm sorry. And, and de Beauvoir, they popularize, uh, existentialism and phenomenology in, in France at the time. And, um, and it's, it, 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 and that dominates, especially through Lacan's discourse and someone like, uh, Deleuze's, uh, mentor and teacher, his, uh, dissertation supervisor, Jean Hippolyte, who translates Hegel's logic of science for the first time in the forties and brings that into France. And it's, and it's against that, that um, partly, well, on Deleuze, it's very prominent, but Foucault himself, you can see this in his dissertation um, in The History of Madness, that part of what is being rejected, if not outright rejected, but also fought against, is this dominance of Hegel and Heidegger uh, on, a, on a very prominent uh, scale. And this is sought through a kind of a navigation of uh, Freud on the one hand, but through the lens no longer of Hegel, but through the lens of someone like uh, uh, of the of the Marx and, and Nietzsche conjunction. This is what I think Deleuze and Foucault were very interested in, and this is why they headed the editions, the the collected editions of Nietzsche that you uh, uh, that you brought out, and um, so they were both very sensitive to how Nietzsche inflects. Um, Marx, uh, because obviously Marx had been the very dominant in the French uh, universities at the time as well. And so the, the, I guess, I guess, but your question though was about kind of the, the question of the significatory aspect of French philosophy, spe specifically these postmodern, post-structuralist thinkers. And uh, is that, is that right? Is that kind of what, you, where you were kind of, do you, do you agree that the because maybe you don't even agree. Maybe you see it differently. Do you, but do you agree that the 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 kind of flowering of radical French theory that happens in the mid to late twentieth century, um, especially that which becomes very influential in American academia, like deconstruction in particular, um, Derrida's project in particular, and and Foucault also, do you agree that um, there is a kind of there's some sort of tendency to kind of over aggrandize or kind of rhetorically inflate like you know that is a common accusation and sometimes i've wondered if maybe it's because of how it's translated that it just kind of sounds a little ridiculous in english but if you could read it in the french you would actually think it's way more reasonable uh is that how you see it or or do you agree with the critique that there's something going on where you know these people really like to kind of uh exaggerate their claims <laughs> I, I think it depends on which authors. Now, I, I think it depends on which authors we we particularly look at because yeah. I don't think necessarily that reading someone like say Lacan or Derrida in the French is going to somehow make them any less opaque at times. I think that I think uh, for for what I from what I have seen. Uh, translators have done a pretty diligent job uh, and careful job in translating uh, someone like Derrida and Lacan. And I think that part of what makes, um, you know, I, I, off the top of my head, when you, when you brought up some of the difficulties in reading some of these thinkers, for me, uh, Derrida is difficult, at least in his early work in the 60s, 
uh, specifically of grammatology, one of his most famous works, probably sometimes some of the, uh, that may be the only thing some people read when they have to study him in English departments, um, or at least some excerpts from texts that are furthering, uh, further elaborating uh, insights from, of grammatology like uh, dissemination and, and, and margins of philosophy. But, you know, Derrida, Derrida is hyper conscious of how language is working. And some of that, I think he takes to a kind of experimental, I mean, in texts like Gloss and, and, and these other texts, he, he goes hyper, um, it's a hyper consciousness about how language is working, how writing is working. And, 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 and maybe that, I, and, and, and I think that you, especially in the eighties, um, but as I saw in English departments, these thinkers that are, when you start to read and write on Derrida, you start to write like Derrida. And Laruel, and, and to, to talk about someone I've translated before, Francois Laruel in the 70s and 80s, you know, he was, he was interested in this conjunction of Derrida and Deleuze, uh, these two thinkers of difference and difference. And uh, he himself kind of can take his writing, uh, his early writing into a way that almost parodies the two of them. But I would say, so for me, um, now, now I think, I, th I find later Derrida to be actually uh, a little bit chill. He, he chills out on some of that. Um, and I find him much more uh, precise and to the point, um, not to say that he's not as difficult, but you know, some of his earlier writing, like of grammatology, I do think it's opaque. With Lacan, someone like Lacan, um, I think that even though he claimed a return to Freud, um, again, depending on the seminar you look at, I find that he can be extremely difficult. Now, in my opinion, his first two seminars or Seminar 10, which is one of his most uh, influential, the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, I find that he's actually quite readable. Um, but if you look at one, uh, his, what is it? It's like, uh, I think it's seminar 20 encore. It's on feminine jouissance and these things. I think he is doing some of the things that SoCal and Brinkmont criticize, which is kind of seemingly a faux erudition, a kind of maybe, a, a, maybe a kind of perverse importation of scientific concepts into the humanities that seem without justification, um, a kind of a feeling at least of pseudoscientificity. And um, so again, it's not just various thinkers, but even within the same thinker, depending on which work you look at, I find that they can be, um, these French thinkers can seemingly be on the extreme diametrical opposite of what you brought up with what's going on in the, uh, the, the, the Anglophone um, thinkers like Wittgenstein and, and uh, who spawned a kind of renewal of uh, what you might call analytic philosophy, um, which has its own problems, I think, uh, taken to a different extreme uh, as though one could uh, fetishize ordinary language and solve all the problems of philosophy by uh, erecting a kind of, on its own, and false standard of clarity um, by by maybe a kind of um, simplicity erected on the other end, as though you know Aristotle's dictum about transparency could be found in a in a different vein. So, um, on, but just the last thing I'll say. I think that um, Deleuze gets lumped in here a little bit too easily um, be because I find that depending on the work, of, for example, his, his own writing leading up to, say, Difference of Repetition, which is a very difficult work but extremely clear, and the footnotes he leaves you, he leaves you the, the trail of breadcrumbs to show how he gets to his original work. But all the works he's doing leading up to that are these brilliant, very precise, very clear monographs on starting with Hume, uh, going up through, I mean, he writes a book on Nietzsche, he writes a book on Bergson, he even writes a book on uh, Proust, so showing that he's not just uh, doing the philosophical tradition, but bringing in the literary, he, he um, 
I'm leaving other thinkers out, but he writes a book on Kant, whom he considers an enemy. He even calls him that. Um, so I, I find that Deleuze perhaps gets lumped in because capitalism is schizophrenia, the two volumes, including the middle volume uh, on Meyer literature, the, the, rem the rumination on Kafka, that what he writes with Guattari perhaps gets him landed in this same um, group because I think Anti-Oedipus is a radical break from his earlier work. And I do think that it's, it's, it's not only difficult, but it is, it, it, it's, it, it gets outside of the history of philosophy from uh, which he has been working in so closely and radically opens him to this exteriority that uh, is really due to the fact that Guattari is the one who wrote Anti-Oedipus and Capitalism are in A Thousand Plateaus. At least the majority of the pages, as Deleuze says, Guattari was the one writing all this stuff, and Deleuze was editing and rewriting with him. And I think Guattari swept him up in this line of flight. And uh, I think for a good, I think, I think for, the, for, for the better, um, I think without that, Deleuze would have perhaps remained merely... Or he might be thought of today merely as a historian of philosophy, and that is not at all what he, at least for me, he is considered. Anyway, I've talked a lot. I'm going to step back, but I was kind of start. I only talked about a few thinkers, but um, someone else like Foucault, on the other hand, I think is very, very clear, and he's not lumped in. When, when Sokol and Brinkmont have a list of thinkers that they lampoon and and uh, and, and criticize Foucault is not in there. Um, Foucault, I think, maybe resists this uh, general tendency of opacity, of, as you said, floweriness. Uh, in my opinion, Foucault is a very clear writer and a very original thinker. Um, and I can't, off the top of my head, think of a think of passages that make me have to pause and wonder if. The performativity is being privileged above what is being said. Does that make sense? I think maybe that that's a good way of how I would put it. Maybe sometimes someone like Derrida and Lacan put performativity above clarity. Yeah, I think that's a totally reasonable way to explain it. Um, I mean, what what I've a long thought about this, and I'd, I'd be I'd be very curious to hear your impressions if this resonates with you or if you think it's missing something. But what I've always what I've always thought about this uh, this reception of French theory in America and all of the weird political polemics that have responded to it is that what a lot of people don't understand is that France has a very peculiar intellectual culture where there is this sort of history. There's this sort of history of highly influential philosophers. Philosophers are worshipped in France, at least you know for for a lot of their uh, at least for, for a lot of the modern history of. France. I think this still lingers on in, in many ways, uh, more so than in a country such as the U.S. or the U.K., although I do think that, you know, the forces of global capitalism and contemporary media dynamics are, um, you know, perhaps uh, reigning in this this classical tradition in France where where philosophers are basically like celebrities. But nonetheless, for most of its modern history and certainly throughout the 20th century, um, there is this this reigning tradition in France, and it's very unique. We don't have that in the UK and the US, um, where you know the most important philosophers in in France at any particular moment in time are almost like you know we see it's almost it's very hard to describe to Anglo people like how important you know the reigning French philosophers of the day are in popular culture. Like normal people, like you know uh, normal people would have known who Lacan was, or they would have at least known his name. You know, his name would have rang quite far, quite far and wide. His name would have rang much farther and much wider than, you know, whoever the, whoever the leading philosopher in England is like, no one knows who the leading English philosopher is today. Like no, almost no one knows or no, and no one cares. Um, so, so yeah, so that's very peculiar feature of, of French intellectual, uh, culture and, and the French national tradition that a lot of people don't understand. But when you when you realize that and you just kind of recognize that they have this peculiar kind of philosophy as celebrity culture, um, things start to make a lot more sense because what it means, I basically, my theory of this is that this it, it, tradition has kind of two implications or effects. And one of them is really positive and one of them is negative, basically. And, 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 and the story goes like this, I think. Because 
philosophers are so respected in France, uh, and there is this kind of uh, reverence, this popular reverence for, you know, the leading philosophers of the day. This actually really helps radical French theorists uh, pursue in- super interesting and extraordinary lines of flight, as you might call it, uh, that other, that other philosophers in other countries just aren't able to really pursue. It, it gives kind of the French you know, the aspiring French theorist or the aspiring French philosopher, it gives them stakes and a motivation and a kind of uh, lived social seriousness and and self-worth that most philosophers in other countries just don't have. And it actually does help them. It, it helps propel them to extraordinary uh, heights of, of intellectual and literary achievement, uh, I think. I, I think that's one of the reasons why I've been so interested in, because I've always been I've always been curious, like, why am I so interested in French philosophers? Why was I so kind of impressed by, you know, the the entire corpus of someone like Jean-Paul Sartre? Or why do I find someone like Deleuze's writings just so uniquely, almost mysteriously deep and profound and, and just Im- inspiring? And, and, you know, what is it about French philosophy that has that gives it these qualities? And I think part of it is because you only really get that kind of magic when philosophers are really valued and respected in a society, or at least that's that's part of my theory. Um, but of course, the downside of that, I think, and this is kind of the second part of my theory, is that you know there are there are risks to this to this reality, and and the risk is you, people get oh, uh, an overinflated sense of themselves. They get a little addicted to their own influence or or prestige or renown. Uh, they come to like it a little bit too much, and yeah, as you as you put it previously, the the performative aspects start to perhaps play an over you know, an, a, an outsized role and that just leads to you know certain peculiar tendencies such as uh, a certain propensity to use overly flowerly language that you know in other countries in other countries philosophers wouldn't be so bold and daring as to be so self-aggrandizing because they have a more modest sense of uh you know what what they're actually doing and 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 the actual constraints on, you know, the relatively modest abilities of, of philosophy and theory to make pronouncements of, of the world. So I've always kind of seen the rhetorical excess as, you know, a price that I'm willing to pay for for the the real uh, creativity and extreme, uh, you know, genius that I think is often uh, propelled by this this kind of popular adoration of of philosophers in France. So that's my little rant and I'll pass it back to you. What's interesting about the shift from Hegel dominating the time period between World War One and World War II to the post-World War II uh, explosion of someone like Nietzsche and the re and hit and, and Marx being um, not that he was ever absent, but being crossbred with Nietzsche, uh, you know, due to Deleuze, Derrida and Foucault is the fact that Nietzsche was, always a, also a poet and a writer and a philosopher. Sometimes philosophers discount him and want to say he was just a writer, which I think is uh, either jealousy or absurd. And in a certain way, it's absurdity. If you think about the earliest Greeks, even like someone like Plato, maybe not Aristotle, he might be, the, the analytic philosophers might be like, oh, we're more Aristotelian. But, you know, Plato, you could say, was more of a writer than a philosopher. But that would be to make a grave error. So there's something that Nietzsche inspires in, in writers like uh, Derrida and Deleuze and even Foucault on his, on his side that um, shows the importance of writing. Um, and I think it also gets back in touch with especially the 19th century explosion of literary excellence in France with thinkers like um, Flaubert and... Uh, Proust, and I could go on and on, but of course, France has a long literary history too, and France has always been uh, proud of its cultural exports. Um, Anyway, I guess what I'm saying is part of the floweriness, part of the experimental writing, part of the uh, deviation from what we might consider the norm in terms of the history of philosophy is, I think, Nietzsche's writerly uh, excellence. And the other thing I would say too, is that the 20th century, if the 19th century really was the, uh, era of the French novelist and poet, uh, the 20th century was the popularity, as you said, of the French philosopher. For example, 
And this is interesting to me. You kind of brought up the fact that, uh, you know, France and Europe have, because Germany too, uh, I think shows this too. They've always been proud of their philosophers. Their philosophers, and I include Lacan in this, as you said, have been the, the, not just celebrate, I mean, and really celebrated um, to the extent that the everyday Frenchman with, an, uh, with a, a modest education would know of these thinkers. But I do want to bring up the fact that Bergson, after he published his, well, not just after, okay, uh, about a decade after he publishes his dissertation, um, he then publishes Matter and Memory and Creative Evolution. Uh, the dates are something like, uh, 1889 is when he publishes a dissertation which gets translated first in uh, 1910. And then Creative Evolution is published in 1907 and gets translated in 1911. Matter and Memory is published, sorry, a decade earlier, but uh, is translated in 1911. So you have three of his main works, some of his best work, translated in 1910 and 1911 in America. And when he comes to America in 1913 to give a lecture at Columbia University, he is actually responsible for the first recorded traffic jam in American history on Broadway. People were so enthused in America to, to see this uh, at, because of the translations, he gained international renown like overnight. And he caused this stir that perhaps is unrivaled in, um, you know, uh, American um, history. And then you have someone like Sartre who gains a similar type of celebrity status, at least in France, but definitely abroad. And Foucault himself tried to avoid it, but um, by his late life too, he became somewhat of a, a, a celebrity as well, uh, more so than Deleuze, who as we know, never traveled abroad much and partly because of his health. Um, so anyway, I, I kind of, I totally agree with, with your statement about how uh, in America and even England, perhaps, um, these, uh, these types of thinkers aren't as celebrated. But I did want to just kind of mention that Bergson, if there was a thinker, now if obviously he's French, but if there was a thinker that, that aroused a kind of um, uh, furor for philosophical. Now, I think part of it too, though, is the fact that Bergson um, is an interesting figure. Totally different, I think. Even though he has, he, he's very uh, expressive in his writing. He is uh, definitely different than you know a Derrida, Deleuze, etc. But the fact that he inv he he investigates science. Yeah, I just, uh, last thought, I think that because of his investigations in science, that, that gives him a cross, you know, a cross disciplinary appeal. So go ahead. Right. Well, we can go back to that in a second, because I, I absolutely agree with you about Deleuze and science. And that's actually one of my main interests, I would say, in philosophy right now. So we should return to mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I just wanted to say very briefly, that's absolutely fascinating what you said about uh, Bergson. And was I mishearing you or did you say that was in America? That the traffic he came, jam. He came to Columbia occurred. University in 1913, and it was was giving lectures on uh, matter and memory, and, which would have just been published a few years earlier, and creative evolution, which, uh, even though it was published a decade before, um, was was just uh, creative evolution and um, matter and memory were translated in the same year, 1911, and then two years later he comes to Columbia University and he causes the first recorded traffic jam in uh, on on Broadway. That is so that is so hilarious, and you wouldn't you would you you wouldn't suspect that because uh, you know his name does not travel as as widely as it as it might have uh, today. It, it, he's actually quite obscure, uh, and in fact. People only really know about him or care much about him today, it seems, if they're interested in Deleuze. Well, he, Deleuze resuscitated him. De, he actually, uh, you, you know, when he died right as World War II started, and uh, after World War II, Sartre was uh, the, the hot shit on the block and the new kid on the block, and Bergson had fallen out of fashion. Uh, the phenomenology, Heideggerian, Husserlian, Hegelian uh, investigations 
uh, took over and Berksone kind of almost vanished from, uh, I want to say almost vanished, but he, he fell out of favor and, and Deleuze helped resuscitate a serious interest in philosophical circles, at least in academia with his uh, Bergsonism. Book. So I'm so. just curious, do you happen to know if you don't, I, w- I mean, I wouldn't expect you to necessarily, uh, so don't sure. feel bad if you don't, but how did he get so famous in America in 1913? Well, first of all, he was very famous in France at the time. Um, by the time that, by 1910, when his dissertation was, when the first translations came out of his work, um, his dissertation had already gone into its seventh edition. So uh, that's what, um, 20 years or so? So seven editions, and that's almost one edition every two and a half years, right? Uh, so, um, you know, I think that it's the fact that uh, Berkstone also, you know, if you think about his work, uh, his, his first work is on time and free will. Uh, his, his second work, uh, well, actually before that though, before his dissertation, he writes a book on poetry, specifically Lucretius. Um, and then after that, he, he writes on creative evolution and then matter and memory. So I think that the diversity of, of, of Bergson's investigations, uh, really popularized him. But if I had to guess, if I really had to guess, I think it's because of the investigations of, uh, Darwinian, um, that, 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 that he was one of the first really serious thinkers to undertake a philosophical investigation of uh, explaining and, and elaborating and extending Darwin's um, initial observations. Um, you know, this is something that, that Nietzsche himself undertakes on the side, and even Freud says a few things about, but Bergson dedicates a whole volume uh, to it in, in ways that... Uh, you know, he elaborates these, these, these concepts that Deleuze resuscitates, you know, this notion of duration, this notion of the Elan Vital. Um, and I think that that's partly why um, he became so um, well-read in France. Uh, I, I do think that there was also a kind of lag in, uh, in, in French creative thinking. I think that you know, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, before Hegel gets brought in and and starts a new generation, as I mentioned, I think that Bergson is the one real stellar figure that stands out. Now, I I don't want to, like, you know, diminish any of the other thinkers at the time, but I really do think in terms of um, the the time period in which uh, Bergson is writing, he's really someone that stands out um, above and beyond uh, anyone else. And so I, I, I and uh, in fact, you know, um, and then in the 20s, he, um, and I don't even remember what it is. I'll have to look it up, but he wins a Nobel Prize in literature in 1927. So, uh, you know, I think this is probably after the fact for, um, for, for something that he, he must have published. I, you know, this is something I'll have to, I'll have to look at, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't know why. In I don't know why in America specifically. Uh, now, hit, three books getting translated in two years probably would have caused a stir, and um, you know would have been notable, and there probably would have been a whole uh, you know factory of industry of writers in America writing on him to to really shoot his his star up so high, you know? Right. Well, okay. I mean, those are all interesting leads. Uh, it's just kind of fascinating anyway. So how about we go back to this? Um, (laughs) yeah, fair enough. Uh, that's what podcasts are for, right? Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about, uh, Deleuze and science? Because that's one of my favorite pet topics at the moment. Because, you know, I'm a political scientist by training and by vocation. So I'm, I'm a pretty, you know, hard nosed technical quantitatively trained uh, social scientist. I do mo- most of my, you know, professional academic research is uh, statistical modeling of, of causal relationships. And uh, I have a pretty strong positivist background. And, uh, and I am actually pretty, uh, as far as, you know, ra- people interested in radical theory go, I'm, I'm towards the extreme end of people who think we actually can uh, do pretty well in modeling uh, objective causal relationships 
uh, and the tools of science and, uh, you know, using objective data uh, can actually get us quite far to understanding the reality of, of social dynamics. Uh, it, it's, I think it's very limited uh, and it's it highly contingent uh, because of the, the just the nature of, you know, complex, often nonlinear social phenomena. Uh, but with those major caveats, uh, I'm, I'm actually way more uh, bullish on the prospects for, you know, social science than a lot of my peers uh, who are interested in radical theory. You know, it is a pretty widespread viewpoint in radical theory that, you know, just uh, not even a viewpoint that's almost giving it too much credit, but just a kind of tendency to see science as a suspect. You know, um, a lot of the people today who are most interested in French philosophy uh, because of the the lineage we've discussed, people who read Derrida and do literary theory and stuff like that, often adopt a very kind of anti-science posture at the very least, or, or they have that tendency. I don't mean to be, you know, dismissing all of them with a broad brush, but I think that's a, a fair uh, general statement. Um, and so I have this very kind of uh, relatively weird or unique perspective on on Deleuze in particular, because I see him as uh, extremely empirical. And, and that's very strange to some people because they kind of lump him in with all of radical French theory. And, it, and it's kind of reasonable. Like if you read if you pick up a random book by Deleuze, it does, you know, to, to an untrained ear, it does kind of look like the typical kind of impossible to understand uh, French uh, theory. Uh, you know, lots of uh, really high highfalutin kind of crazy sounding ideas that's more or less impenetrable to even well-educated, you know, scientific types of thinkers in, in, in especially in the Anglo countries. But, you know, I, I read Deleuze and I, I, I see someone who is trying to work within this tradition of, of radical French philosophy. And, and by tradition, I mean more like sociology. You know, he, he's coming up in this kind of uh, sociology of ideas where philosophers are celebrities and he's engaging with, you know, he, he, he's one of his foils with Guattari is, is you know, uh, Lacan. So he's, he kind of has to play in this kind of arena uh, that, we've, that we've dissected a little bit so far. But I actually see him as someone who is really trying to smuggle in the back door of uh, you know, radical French philosophy, uh, a kind of really hardcore commitment to, you know, uh, one of the guiding ethos of, of, of scientific research, which is like an absolute fidelity to empirical data in some sense. I think you see that in his, you know, that's why he's interested in Hume, I think. Uh, you know, the book is about empiricism, basically. And he, he you know, he even describes himself at certain points that, you know, he uses this term of transcendental empiricism. So, a lot, of, but basically, the, what the reason I'm asking you about this is because I, I think I, I almost don't know of anyone in the world who is really mining Deleuze right now for all that he could be mined with respect to his his philosophy as as uh like a a scientific project. I mean, it's kind of like just because the people who are scientists today don't read Deleuze and they see him as you know uh very fluffy kind of uh, excessive philosophical thinker that has nothing to do with science. Um, and then, of course, the people who actually do read Deleuze are generally not trained as scientists, uh, typically. So I'm extremely fascinated in that by that because I see his, his work as essentially, you know, really invested in a kind of scientific uh, project or trying to lend a kind of scientific rigor to, to philosophizing. Um, but I... Yeah, I, 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 I see that clearly enough to know that or to feel strongly and, and feel confidently that that's what's going on with Deleuze. But I don't quite know where to go from there. So I, I would be very curious if you could, you know, especially, you know, as because I'm a sci I am basically a social scientist. I would be very curious to hear from you if you have any leads for me on like how I might, uh, you know, kind of expand on th this kind of scientific interpretation of Deleuze. Or you could just go in any direction from there. Sure. I mean, with Deleuze and science, you know, we mentioned you mentioned Hume, uh, which is very important. Uh, and we talked about Bergson. Um, so, you know, uh, those are two, uh, you know, you could say f they're on the cusp of science, philosophy of science. Um, you know, I mean, for philosophers who are in philosophy of science, they might uh, already be investigated those two, but... You know, uh, they are asking scientific questions. In terms of um, political science and social science, 
uh, in A Thousand Plateaus, uh, I think it's Plateau 8 on Micropolitics, he investigates some of these questions. And uh, he himself tries to sketch out at least one or two voices that he opposes to these major modes of, uh, of, uh, of sociology, for example, which I, I know is, uh, you know, not necessarily social, uh, social political science per se, but, um, the thinker that I am specifically, um, thinking of is, oh, and I'll have to get back to you on that. But before I do that, I would say that, um, you know, Deleuze's book on, uh, on Leibniz and the, and the fold, uh, the way that he, uh, on, 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 on the, Deleuze's, uh, book on the fold at the end of his life on, on Leibniz, um, and, and takes, uh, takes into account investigations that he was already doing in his seminars in the seventies and eighties. Um, for example, some of the seminars on web uh, Deleuze that you can find uh, that have been translated by people like Timothy S. Murphy, who I think also translated The Fold, um, and Simon Duffy, who is very interested in Deleuze and the history of mathematics. He actually has a book uh, called In Defense of the New. Or no, it's called Deleuze and the History of Mathematics, In Defense of the New. Deleuze's secondary dissertation is on philosophy, uh, Spinoza and the problem of expression. And uh, in many ways, the way that Deleuze writes about Spinoza in this work, uh, one of his most scholarly works, and I mean that in the most academic sense, right? In the way in which the footnotes are uh, oriented in such a way that one can devise a whole investigation of Spinoza uh, through this book alone, right, uh, you know, um, in any case, the, the way that Deleuze reads Spinoza in this work, and you can see it applied in Difference Repetition, Logic of Sense, and uh, specifically A Thousand Plateaus more generally. But in this work, he reads Spinoza as someone undertaking a scientific problem, one could say, a scientific problem of one, you know, the way in which Spinoza is perhaps wrongly, but thought of at the time as a heretical pantheist or panentheist, Deleuze undertakes this question through the lens of expression, through the question of the university of uh, substance, uh, through the attributes and the, and the modes. The, the way in which Deleuze reads Spinoza is very much the way in which I think he treats Spinoza as a scientist, uh, a scientist un investigating the question of being and and a scientist and the way in which I think that Spinoza himself perhaps at least tried to emulate uh, science and mathematics is the way in which Euclid's elements is taken as the scaffold, as the structural blueprint for the ethics and the way in which the axioms and the definitions unfold into the propositions in the scolia. And then the way in which Leibniz and Kant are played off in their question of the analyticity or the syntheticity of the a priori and the a posteriori, he reads them as mathematicians, the, uh, you know, and, and uh, the way in which um, subjects and predicates are, are, are brought in. But that's a more metaphysical, uh, I think, line of scientificity that Deleuze undertakes. With the question of, of social science and sociology, I also think that he reads Foucault kind of investigating. Uh, he reads Foucault very much seriously as undertaking um, scientific questions. Even if Foucault is not a, a scientist in a certain sense, in another sense, the way in which he is investigating a, um, the overlapping but different and distinction, the differentiation and distinction of the history of ideas and history of thoughts, Foucault's uh, investigation is, is scientific. Again, even though he is not writing in, the, in that discourse. Well, I think you're right. I mean, Foucault is obviously very empirical. Um, and I think, I, think, I think I agree with something you said before, which is that Foucault also gets a bad rap. I mean, I think, I think Derrida... I think Derrida and Lacan are kind of guilty as charged for certain kind of uh, narcissistic excesses, maybe. 
Um, even then, I don't. Hold, I, I think they're both actually quite brilliant, and I don't really hold it against them that much personally. But I think I, I at least understand the charge there. I think Foucault is actually really quite modest. I mean, I think he's really trying to get to the bottom of certain empirical phenomena, and he's and he's doing his he's doing his honest best to to stay close to to the empirical data. Of course, he's doing it in a kind of radical French philosophical tradition and sociology, but and, and also as someone who. Uh, whether he likes it or not, is occupying a certain kind of influential celebrity philosopher role, uh, and and needs to needs to kind of do play that role to some degree. Uh, so I agree that Foucault is also uh, unfairly lumped in, just like Deleuze is unfairly lumped in it, with that crowd. He's not a, he's not necessarily a positivist insofar as the data he is using is not the same as maybe you would use, but he is uh, he is empirical. The kind of documents that he uses, the primary sources that he goes to, I think are much more historically uh, significant or singular than what Deleuze would rely on. Uh, the kind of annals of history that Foucault is working through is, uh, is much different. And in that vein, uh, the, the, but, but to, to get back to the social science question, the sociology question, in micropolitics and, uh, and segmentarity, that's um, Plateau 8, it's the, the two thinkers that he plays off of each other is um, someone like Durkheim, who is very important for the birth of sociology as a discipline, besides August Comte, um, uh, who, who undertakes a kind of major mode these grand, he's looking at these molar formations, as Deleuze might say, and Guattari might say, whereas someone like Gabriel Tard, someone that doesn't get as much interest either then or now, perhaps Deleuze looks to, Deleuze and Guattari look to someone like Gabriel Tard, whom they call a long forgotten, uh, they talk about his long forgotten work and how, what, uh, you know, Durkheim is looking at these great collective representations, these binary, resonant, overcoded representations, whereas someone like Tarda is looking at these collective, uh, micro political, uh, these almost infinitesimal sub representative regimes. You know, someone like Durkheim and the Durkheimians might say that, oh, Tarda is not a sociologist, he's actually looking at psychology or interpsychology. But, uh, you know, in fact, you know, Deleuze and Guattari argue that he should be, you know, what Tarda is, is interested in are, are flows and these quanta, uh, these sub-representative, these mi- that they would, they would use the word um, molecular, right? That's what Tarda is interested in. It's, he's, he's kind of one of the sociologists they, they look to who is investigating these questions of a molecular nature what is it that constitutes a the molecular uh, sub space the sub uh, uh, what's underneath these molar um, uh, representations that, that actually presuppose these molecular formations but again that's not necessarily scientists I mean when, when, when it comes to science to Liz and Guattari, I think the best way to go for at least in terms of their work together, is, you know, in, um, I believe it's, I th- I could be wrong, but I think it's, um, you know, Plateau 11, doesn't matter, but it's on uh, major science and minor science, right? Ro- royal science and minor science. And they look to someone like Archimedes and his hydraulic model as opposed to, um, you know, these, these large scale thinkers, these thinkers like Euclid and, and what he's famous for Euclidean representation. And so they, this is actually, pick, this is a great way to pick up for, you know, someone who I'm translating now, who uh, forthcoming next year is his work, uh, Simon Don's work. Uh, he is very important for Deleuze because Simon Don is arguing that for 2000 years, um, philosophy uh, specifically with Plato and Aristotle, the, the linchpins, they've kind of both given these two models, these molar models of looking at being, of looking at the individual. One from the archetypal uh, element, the regime of forms and ideas, and of course, Aristotle on the realm of the hylomorphic model of matter and form, and that what was lacking was a science of... What well, what was lacking was 
the explosion of scientific discoveries in the 19th century that led to theories like um, thermodynamics and, of course, that leads to relativity, but also the questioning of Euclidean space with Riemann and Lobachevsky, the, the non-Euclidean suspension of the parallel po uh, lines postulate that leads to an under, a greater understanding of uh, metastability. And it's with the scientific understanding of metastability that we can start to understand the role of potential, the role of information in the, in the active sense, uh, and the role and, and thinking, and now thinking the individual based on individuation, not the other way around. Uh, and so I think that, uh, in the background for Simon Don, or for Deleuze, uh, in terms of the philosopher hyphen scientists that influence him. You know, we said Bergson, uh, I mentioned Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, uh, but I think Simon Don, and I mentioned to you earlier outside of the podcast, Rouillet, who is undertaking these, uh, these, these novel, this rehabilitation of Descartes and, and looking at morphogenesis, looking at what he calls neo-finalism, you know, looking at re reinvestigating the ma the body consciousness problem uh, in, in a contemporary vein. Um, so I, I do think Deleuze, more than someone like Derrida, who is inflected more by Heidegger and Husserl in terms of a phenom phenomenological investigation of writing and speech uh, at the start. I mean, for Deleuze, the question has always been inspired. I think he's always been more of a, a scientifically minded uh, individual. The thing is that Deleuze and Guattari cite a whole shitload of people. And, you know, you don't really know, like, you don't really know which ones you should focus on. Like, if you're really, if you really want to grok what they're trying to do and understand the the influences, you, you don't really know which ones to start with or which ones kind of to focus more on. So, the names that you dropped helped me kind of narrow down uh, the stuff I might look into more. So that that was that was actually really good. Um, the little rant you just gave. This has been this has been a really interesting and uh, edifying romp through uh, French philosophy. But I'm thinking in the last ten minutes we should talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you're up to. And uh, I'd like to know a little bit more in your own words just about um, you know you you have this website. Uh, with Joe, who you mentioned before, uh, fractal on on fractal ontology, and you guys are are quite prolific. I mean, there's a lot of original writing up there and and original translations, and um and I, I know that you guys also have a kind of uh, corresponding podcast project that you guys are maintaining. So I wonder if you could just tell me and and also tell my listeners a little bit about like what you like what you guys are trying to do. Yeah, uh so with Fractal Ontology, it really jump started in 2007, so it's about a decade old. I will say that in the past 3 or 4 years, to be honest, the writing uh, basically around 2014, Joe and I, we both moved around and kind of uh, I want to say we didn't have a falling out. We just, uh, we had a hiatus uh, that happened. And both on the writing end and on the communication end, um, you know, we were involved in our own projects and just, uh, this was before our podcast. And so, to be honest, Fractal Ontology has, has, has more or less been dormant. And I will, I do want to mention that, um, you know, the... When that around the time that actually uh, fractal ontology started to, to to go on hiatus was actually it predates that by a few years. Around 2010, when I got into Emory, uh, I joined up with two other thinkers, uh, Nick Cernisek and Ben Woodward, uh, who are both engaged in uh, you know speculative realism and uh, you know um, other avenues you know, object-oriented ontology, all of that. Uh, I joined up with them and we had a, this was another blog. This is a, a blog called Speculative Heresy, which is where the majority of my translations uh, are actually currently residing. Specifically, um, the, the majority of the time, this was when I was, um, before I translated the Dictionary of Non-Philosophy and Philosophy of Non-Philosophy, this was when, I uh, just started translating all sorts of, uh, of Laura Wells essays, Francois Laura Well, who, um, you know, as I mentioned to you before, but I'll say for your listeners, 
In Deleuze and Guattari's last work, What is Philosophy?, they have two very provocative footnotes uh, uh, that just, one of which, the last, the very last footnote on the book, I think, uh, the, besides, I think, a citation, is about Laurel, and they ask this question about his non-philosophy, and they cite philosophy and non-philosophy, and they say, like, well, why not a non-science too? To which Deleuze, or to which Laurel um, wrote a 20-page essay response to Deleuze, articulating uh, why this wouldn't be the case. I'll leave that aside. But the very first footnote they have on Laurel, which also cites philosophy and non-philosophy, because philosophy and non-philosophy was published in 88, and I believe what is philosophy is published in 89, 90. In any case, so, uh, they, they say that he is, they give him the highest praise and they say he is one of the most original thinkers writing at the time. Uh, and it was this footnote that like piqued my interest. I had never seen either Deleuze or Deleuze and Guattari say something um, outside of talking about literary uh, and I, 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 outside of talking about artists, I'd never seen Deleuze and Guattari talk about a thinker that way. And I was like, well, what the hell is this non-philosophy stuff? Because they don't really even talk about him in the, the book itself. It's just that, that those footnotes. And so I started translating uh, Laura Wells' essays, uh, uh, certain introductions to his work. For example, um, one of the, I mentioned Laura Wells' early work being a kind of, uh, mixing of Deleuze and Derrida, and this is very evident in one of the translations I had on. It's a translation of, a, of his introduction, uh, of an introduction to his book called Textual Machines. And he, in fact, he, he does a little wordplay and says he's interested in the, the Deli Da Deru's um, series. And he's, um, he's playing with the, with the misappropriation of the proper name which Derrida does in his famous text glass, which I find unreadable, but it's very experimental and fun, but I don't, it's not my thing. In any case, the, 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 the stuff that, that Joe and I originally were doing when we were students in undergraduate school was our own writings together and in class, uh, in our you know, our classes on Nietzsche, on metaphysics, on ethics, on uh, for S the classes we took with Sid on uh, Deleuze and Derrida and Badu, and, um, and then our own uh, writings that were usually reflections on the conversations we would have with one another. So that's fractal ontology, and my very first translations are up there too. Um, so that's the kind of stuff we were doing together. But, you know, just this past year, uh, Joe and I, you know, began, we, we reconnected. Uh, we, as I said, we had never had a falling out. We just, you know, we had just uh, kind of gone quiet. And, the, and, and once we reached out to one another, the assemblage came back and resurged in a different form, in a different format. And because... Fractal Ontology, he and I were never necessarily, we would always write in dialogue, but never in tandem. And so the podcast was actually a way that really we should have been doing from the start because, you know, if we could have recorded all the conversations we had had just hanging out, there would be hundreds and thousands of hours. And so it just kind of made logical sense to... Uh, revamp our relationship in a newly creative way. And now we are actually using fractal ontology, but in a slightly different way. Um, for example, you know, I, I, I recently put up a translation of Laura Well on fractal and on speculative uh, because now I'm the only one running speculative. The other two guys have moved on with other things, but uh, it was it was an interesting translation of uh, about biopower by Laura Well, which is just totally outside of his normal realm of writing and it's because it's from 1980 it's a very old work of his an early work uh, but also the most recent publication on fractal ontology is a draft chapter from a new book that's coming out well that's being written i should say by my friend katarina kolitsova she's a prolific writer in her own right uh, she's a sociology professor actually yeah, and she's she's written uh, books on Laura Well as well. She's got a book called The Cut of the Real and uh, a book on Laura Well and Marx. Um, 
that's very recent as well. And she also writes on uh, on gender theory, on queer theory. So she's uh, so I, I but but her first language is not English. In fact, I think her second language isn't even English. Uh, her first language is Serbo Croatian, and then she learned French, and then German, and then English. And so she she shared. She wanted me to publish. Uh, a draft of hers, and I think if I weren't a translator, I would be I would be an editor. And so I edited her chapter, and I and I I, I you know it was very much improved. I won't I'll brag about myself, and I put it up on Fractal and Speculative um, because originally she she claims that I uh, helped her get outside of her little corner of Europe. But anyway, you asked a question about me and Joe, but that's the kind of things we're doing. We're, now we're trying to figure out what fractal ontology does now. And now it's just kind of a, it's a space that hopefully we'll add more to. Uh, but the, the podcast theory talk is really what we, uh, we spend a lot of our energy on. Cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, my, my, the larger spirit of my question was just uh, to give readers a sense of just what you're working on right now and what your kind of main interests are so I, I i happen to have come across i found you through uh just happening to come across fractal ontology and i noticed that there was a lot of uh interesting stuff up there so that's what i meant by prolific but uh apparently you're working on other projects also and fractal ontology is not the the place you're uploading things that much right now but uh i think the the spirit of the the question was answered so thank you and i'm aware you have to go so i don't i'm not i don't want to keep you overly long uh, i think we should basically wrap it up i don't want to abuse your attention i think you know you're a super interesting dude who's uh doing really important work you know i think the work of translation is not appreciated or celebrated or respected nearly enough i mean you're kind of at the frontier of some really really fascinating and important thinkers that people in the English world would not have access to if it weren't for you. Um, you know, especially your translations of uh, uh, Guattari in particular, super, you know, important and valuable contributions. So uh, I just want to kind of say, I think that's, that's really good and really cool. And this was a really interesting and useful uh, and fun kind of freewheeling discussion about French philosophy. So I just want to thank you very much for doing what you're doing. And oh, I should also let listeners know that I think I'm pretty sure you and, uh, Joe, uh, have a little Patreon going for the podcast, right? So if people are interested in, you know, radical French theory in particular, but also just philosophy and, uh, kind of open non-institutional free, you know, discussion of, about, uh, theoretical and philosophical topics, and that's something that you're interested in, want to support, you know, uh, they should definitely go check out your, your work and, uh, your platforms and stuff like that. Well, thanks, Justin, and I appreciate you plugging the Patreon page. Uh, we do not yet have a uh, – it's actually a new uh, thing we set up. Uh, around the time we hit about 50 episodes, Joe was kind of like, hey, let's let's uh, put some alternative content up and try to get some, some patrons. And, uh, you know, uh, so if people want to give us money, uh, I think – uh, five dollars is the minimum to get unlimited access to uh, the uh, basically every other episode we kind of throw up on we try to do uh, exclusive content for our viewers and uh, I guess two things one uh, I didn't even get to talk about I guess the you know the the translations that I'm finishing up now are, are threefold. One is uh, Simon Don's 1958 primary dissertation, uh, Individuation in Light of the Notions of Form and Information. This is a book that has should have come out about a decade ago, and people are really looking forward to it. In fact, once it's published, I will probably say that it's the most important translation I've ever done and may ever do just in, in terms of the reception that it's um it's long awaited for it's been long awaited you know it's 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 the 60 years you know 60th anniversary of this book that should have been out 60 years ago uh in, in english and the other work i i have a there's a second book by uh, this is by university of minnesota press uh the other work that's also coming out hopefully next year both of these works will be published next year by next year is also by uh, Gilbert Simondon it's one of his lecture courses it's called course on perception and it's much much more easygoing and and um not that it's more readable i think simondon is highly readable um 
but it's it's it, it, it's specifically on perception from the ancients up to uh, Gestalt theory and sort of its role in philosophical reflection and in the sciences. And lastly, the the other work I'm working on is with Rocco Gangle, who is also a translator of Francois Laruelle. And it is, we are uh, co-translating uh, probably, I would say, Francois Laruelle's masterpiece, which is uh, non-standard philosophy. Uh, this is his most recent iteration of his systematic view. This is what he now calls non-philosophy. So... Um, those three works, hopefully all three of those works will be, um, and I've actually, you know, I'm done translating those two. The Perception book, I've got another mm, 50 or so pages, but uh, those are all, I'm just waiting on, we're just kind of uh, going to throw them to the presses. Uh, they're in various stages of, of the final stages, and you know how there's a kind of slow uh, pace, but uh, hopefully they'll all be out maybe next this time next year so uh great all right cool thanks tyler thanks and thanks for all the work you're doing appreciate it all right justin i appreciate it and uh you have a wonderful day and again thanks for having me on and for all you listeners out there thanks for listening uh justin this has been quite a pleasure and uh i'll uh i'll 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 let you uh i'll send you a message uh later in the evening buddy